You might wonder why on earth I would title a sermon, What Kind of Ventus Are You? I will give you a little bit of history behind where the title came from. And why, in spite of the title, it is a very relevant message for us today. We just would like to welcome our online audience first because many of them take the time to tune in and join us from wherever you are in the world. And thank you for doing that. Thank you for your prayers and all that you do to get the message that we believe uplifts Jesus here in Thompsonville. So thank you for joining us this Sabbath morning. We just came from two weeks of exciting evangelism. And we're planning to have a, a series here for our church in April of next year. Do some good groundwork. We have guys coming back from AFCO, and we're going to get them ready, get the groundwork going. We thank the Lord for our young people that are now involved in canvassing all this preparatory work to inform our community of the events that are to come. When you're on the ground working for the Lord, the devil is always busy, always. These series of meetings that we held in Pleasant Hill, California, to me were one of the better meetings that we've held for a number of years. Set my timer up so I could make sure and get you out of here today. <laughs> we know the devil was upset because the battle was great at the church, among the members, on the internet, in email. We were under attack from outside, inside, digital attack, family attacks, accusatory attacks. It was coming from every direction. Every day there was something new to deal with. And the sad reality of it was all coming from Adventists. So I asked myself the question, what kind of Venice are these? That these, these avenues, these doors would be opening up at a time when we're reaching out to people, inviting them to know the Lord, why would all these attacks be coming? And so the question came to me in a very real way. What? kind of people what on earth and I ask myself as we are getting ready for the coming of Jesus how many of you are getting ready for the coming of Jesus can you say amen, amen. the devil knows we're getting ready for the coming of Jesus and he wants to do everything in his power everything in his sphere of influence to make sure that we are distracted our focus is somewhere else, and something else has taken up the priority that should be used in getting prepared for the coming of the Lord, such is always the case. Wherever meetings are held, the servant of the Lord says every time the message goes forth, Satan has his agents present on the ground to challenge the message. I was given a message a uh, number of years ago when we lived in California, it was in the Fortuna. I think it was in the Fortuna area. I'm not exactly sure of the city, but I think that's what it was. Close to the coast in Northern California. And a retired pastor came to me, retired Adventist pastor came to me and he said, I have something that I want to share with you that did not make it in the writings of Ellen White, but it's at the Ellen White, found, it's at the Ellen White Estates. And I, since I worked there for a while, I'd like to give you a copy of it. And I want you to read it tomorrow evening to the congregation. And I thought, okay, I'll be glad to do that. I don't know what the purpose of it was, but I read it. And he said, the quote was this, this was the quote. He says, every time the sermon is preached, I don't want you to get nervous, wherever the seats are empty, Satan's angels occupy those seats 
to create a barrier between the message and those who to receive it. And I mentioned that at the Fortuna Church, and um, the next night, the back seats were empty. The front seats were filled. <laughs> they said, we don't want any barriers between the messenger and the message. And I thought, I never thought about that. Every time the message of God goes forth, there are angels on the ground seeking to match. It could happen a number, a number of ways. We had a lady that stood up while I was preaching about washing away the past. I was talking about Jesus, his way of delivering us from sin. And she stood up and said, I have a testimony. We were on air. I have a testimony. What's the answer? What's the answer? And I said, sister, if you hold on, the answer is going to come. But I have a testimony. And she was determined to get her testimony heard during the broadcast. And just then the Lord reached down and touched a little puppy that was one, one row in front of her, and he started to bark. And it got her, got her attention, and she sat down and started to pet the puppy. And then they were able to escort her out. And all through the week, there was one challenge after the other. The puppy was the only non-Adventist that helped me. <laughs> but then again, he may have been. But um, so I want you to get, just get some of the background. This has been going on in my mind, and my wife has been asking me, are you still going to preach that message? I said, I am. She said, but there's so many other messages to preach. I said, I want to encourage our people to hold on to be the kind of Ventist that are getting ready for the coming of Jesus. Is that all right? Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Loving Father in heaven, take this message and find fertile soil in the hearts of your people. May you be exalted and uplifted, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The sermon begins now. Let's go to Mark chapter 8 and verse 27. Look at the scripture reading for this morning. Mark 8 and verse 27. The words of Jesus. Significant, I've heard this scripture for many years, and I decided not just to hear it, but to study it and to find out why the Lord would ask such a question. Mark, who was the underdog disciple, says to us this morning, now Jesus and his disciples went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And on the road, he asked his disciples, saying to them, Who do men say that I am? The first thing that came to my mind is, if this wasn't important, Jesus would not have asked the question. If he didn't want people to understand who he is, he wouldn't ask the question. If he didn't want to get into the minds of his disciple on this question, he would not have asked it. Who do men say that I am? When you begin to study the preceding, the chapters that came before this chapter, and the context of this chapter, what led up to this was Jesus was performing miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle, and the disciples saw what he was doing. In each of those settings, there were at least two types of people in attendance. I would say three. Jesus, his disciples, those being ministered to, and the Pharisees who really didn't care who Jesus was. On many occasions, they sought reasons to malign him and accuse him. So if Jesus didn't think this question was important or the answer was important, he would not ask them, who do men say that I am? He knew the Pharisees did not care who he was. And he was soon to find out that the disciples didn't remember who he was. The Pharisees were so deeply concerned that when Jesus fed the 5,000 and the 4,000, he was building his popularity. People were beginning to be converted to the fact that this is not just a regular teacher. Amen. Regular teachers don't take small quantities of loaves of bread and fish and multiply them 
enough to feed 5,000 people. He cannot be just another rabbi. I've never seen this before. So the Pharisees stood on the side watching Jesus, through the aid of his father, miraculously provide for people in a way that shook their confidence. Every time they saw Jesus perform a miracle, they were wondering, how on earth are we going to get people to reject him when people follow him because he's blessing them? They were there for the feeding of the 5,000. And what concerned them even more was Jesus not only fed the 5,000 and then the 4,000, but the people that he was feeding were not Jews. And that troubled them even more. Why is he feeding people that are not Jewish when we are his chosen people? You read in Mark chapter 8 and verse 11 the surrounding conditions of this story. Then the Pharisees came out and began to dispute with him, that is, with Jesus, seeking from him a sign from heaven, testing him. They said, give us a sign. And Jesus said, no sign would be given to you. Why is it that this generation wants a sign? And I think about it today. There are some people that if Jesus, if Jesus appeared personally and began to perform miracles, people would say, I believe he's the Christ. The reason why that is dangerous is Jesus wants us to believe him based on his word and the difference he makes in our lives rather than just for external evidences. Because anyone that has the ability to perform a sign can deceive someone into thinking that he is the Christ. Because the evidence is, well, if he can turn water into wine, he must be the Christ. If he can turn stone into bread, as the, as the devil tried to convince him, that he must be the Christ. Let us not serve Jesus for the things he does for us, but let us serve Jesus for the things he does in us. The evidence of the world, the evidence the world needs is not to see a larger uh, supply of bread or of water, but they need to see transformed lives. The evidence of the presence of Christ is not what he does externally, but what he does internally. But it's amazing how people forget in difficult times who Jesus is. That's why it was a single moment, just in a single moment, as they were getting away from the multitude, getting away from the Pharisees that were trying to accuse Jesus, they got in the boat, got away from the multitude, and in that short trip, the disciples revealed how they momentarily forgot what Jesus just did. Let's look at verses 13 and 14 together. Mark 8, verses 13 and 14. And he left them, that is the multitude, that is the Pharisees, and getting into the boat again, departed to the other side. Now, the disciples had forgotten to take bread, and they did not have more than how many loaves? One loaf. One loaf with them in the boat. Now, this, this verse caught my attention. Now, I want you to get the backstory because I laid it for you, but you may have missed it. They just saw Jesus take a few loaves and a few fish and feed, feed how many? 5,000. And then do it again and feed how many? 4,000. And here they are in the boat with Jesus, and they're saying, you know, we only have one loaf of bread. Christ is in the boat with them, and they're concerned about food, and they have Jesus with them. We, we are his disciples, but we just don't have enough bread for this journey. What are we going to do? Isn't that ridiculous? Now, as ridiculous as that sounds, some of us are the very same way. A bill is due, and like in our case, whether we travel or not, what do we do? My brothers and my sisters, those that are watching, if God brings you to it, God will bring you through it. 
They saw Jesus feed the 5,000, and then he told the disciples, go gather all the baskets. They did that for themselves. So Jesus had to dip back into their shallow minds and remind them who he is. Look at verses 16 to 20. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, it is because we have no bread. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive nor understand? In other words, is your heart still hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? And then he says in verse 19, when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of fragments did you take up? They said to him, how many, church? Twelve. Twelve. Also, when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of fragments did you take up? And they said, what, friends? Seven. seven. Now, this is relevant. And go back here. I don't want you to see that yet. This is relevant because there they are with how many loaves of bread? And the miracle worker is in the same boat with them. And some of you do the same thing. Pastor, I don't know what I'm going to do on Monday. Wait till Monday gets here. Because God's not going to give you on Sunday what you need on Monday. He's not going to give you the week before what you need the week after. Believe me, I can tell you stories, as I said to those in the evangelistic series, I can just take the rest of the sermons and tell you, rest of the sermon and tell you how God always provides when the need is great. God always comes through. And so what happened in this situation, which I've said before, some of the reasons why the Lord doesn't bring us to difficulties and trials is, is because He needs to be able to trust us to represent who He is at the moment that it appears as though this is a moment that God can't handle. He needs us to say, we know who you are. You are greater than the moment. That's why in verse 21, Jesus said to them, how is it you do not understand? If you were walking down the street with a guy that just won the World Series, whether baseball or basketball championship or the football Super Bowl, you wouldn't think of that person as incapable of accomplishing something in that area of that sport because you just saw them do it. But yet, my brothers and sisters, yet how often do we come to a challenge in our own lives and we forget who Jesus is? So this question, what kind of Ventus are you? Was first, pro, was, was first posed to Christ. So the Lord asked the question to his disciples, and he asked them this question because he wanted them to be adequate representatives of who he is. Let's go back to Mark 8, verse 27 again. So now you see the context. They got to the other side. Now they're out of the boat. This is verse 27. That in the journey, they're warned about bread. Jesus brings up all the instances where he provided bread for the multitudes. The one loaf, the two loaves, the five loaves, the seven loaves. He provides for all the needs of the people that don't know him. So they got to the other side. And I imagine in my mind that after the Lord reminded them of what he had done, that was probably a pretty quiet boat ride. They just got divinely slapped. He told us, didn't he? He reminded us. And I could imagine somewhat in the heart of Christ, he's probably thinking to himself, they just don't understand. So that verse, how is it that you don't understand, was not, how is it that you don't understand? It's almost, how is it that you don't understand? Wondering, what else do I need to do to remind you that I am the all-capable God who sets up galaxies, who puts planets in place and they don't move, they don't ever move? How is it that you don't understand? This is a relevant question to us today. When you face challenges in your life, whatever the challenge may be, remember, 
There's nothing that the Lord can bring you to that he cannot bring you through. Whether it is illness, whether it is financial, whether it is real estate, whether it is the gaining of something or the loss of something, the Lord will never take away what he would not re re uh, replace with something greater. The Lord will not take away that which is greater, which he would not replace with something that is more relevant. Whatever God allows, he is sufficient to the moment. But we've got to get an answer to the question. Because the answer to the, to the question takes us down the road to develop the message even further. So the first question, I, I rephrase the first question, who do men say that I am? The first question to me is, who do people outside of our circle think I am? That was the first question Jesus asked. Who do men, who do those outside of this circle in Thompsonville think we are? Who do the community think we are? If we think that's irrelevant, we will die from insignificance. If we think it doesn't matter what other people think about us, we will lose our relevance. That's why, praise the Lord, our church has decided to reach, more, reach out more to the community to change the way they think we are. The browse around, the young folk, and we've got to do more. Because the the way that people perceive you determines whether or not they're going to listen to you, whether or not you have any relevance in their lives. Jesus saying, in order for me to be effective, who do they say that I am? So here's the, here's the answer. Mark 8, verse 28. So they answered, <laughs> uh, some people think you're John the Baptist. But some say Elijah, others say one of the prophets. <laughs> Which means they don't know who you are. I remember when Janice Chevalier walked in here once, when I first met her, Janice walked in here. She says, um, I'm of the Reformed Church of the Latter-day Saints. Reformed Mormons. She said, I've driven by this building so many times. I just said to myself, I need to go in there and find out who they are. She came in and never left. Come on, say amen. amen. <laughs> and uh, she's watching. Some people didn't come because of the snow. And then I remember, I don't mean to put them on the spot. Uh, you know. Mike, uh, could, I, could I talk to Mike and Chris a little bit? They live in the community. They watch 3ABN go up. Am I right? They listen to 3ABN on the radio. And there they are talking about the Sabbath again. Click. Until one day the Lord gave them a Ten Commandments placard for their lawn. Look at there. The Sabbath is on there. They came in the building and they're still here today. Amen. Amen. If you don't think perception makes a difference... Perception can increase the effectiveness of your ministry or decrease it. So who you are during the week is preparatory to whether people say, when that Pastor Loma King that lost his mind in Walmart, <laughs> I ain't going to his church. He talked like that to the cashier. What does he say to his congregation? Right? Who was the, the guy that works with 3ABN Radio? That really, really tall guy? Getting angry at the gas station? Oh, I'm turning 3ABN Radio off. If that's who works at 3ABN, oh, I don't want to listen to that station. <laughs> you get my point? So this is a very valid, valid question. So I began to see, I began to see church, I began to see that who we are outside of this building, outside of the worship hour, from the time the service ends to the time it convenes again next week, is very relevant. Let me get closer to home. So now the first question is, who do people outside of our circle think we are? But the second question is, let's look at the second question. Who do you say that I am? This is kind of a closer to home situation. So this is the question that the people you work with at 3ABN they might say, man, you know, I know, I know who you think Curtis is, but mm, I've seen Curtis when he lost his, I've seen Curtis lose his temper. 
I know who he is. Praise the Lord, Curtis hasn't lost his temper. Amen, production? I see that humble man walking around, smiling. Uh, I know Brian is all upset about they change the program at the last minute. He has to reprogram it. But Brian does it with a smile. Praise the Lord for that. See, right? And then, then I'm supposed to meet Summer 15 minutes ago to do an on air broadcast, but I'm, I'm late and Summer's still in the foyer waiting with a smile. Praise the Lord. What we don't know is our influence outside of the circle and our influence where? Inside of the circle determines the effectiveness of our, of our ministry. Amen. So who do you say that I am? Here's the question. And here's the answer. Verse 29 of Mark 8. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said, you are the Christ. Let's translate that to the inside. Who do, you, who do people say that Bob is? Bob is a Christian. Leon's a Christian. Larry, thank God for another beautiful day. Amen. He's a Christian. I've seen Larry say that when he was hoarse. Thank God for another beautiful day. Pastor Dinsey, even when he was playing basketball and stole a ball from somebody, he felt guilty and gave it back to them. What a real Christian. See, Brother Jorge, when things are getting tough in the production trenches, my brother from another mother holds it together and pulls it through. Who do people say you are? So this is not irrelevant. I have found out more and more that I have to watch me Inside and outside the pulpit. Anybody ever got to that? Are you, are you there yet that you have to watch your mouth outside the pulpit? I mean, outside the church? I mean, outside of the job? When you get to the place where you have to watch your mouth even at home, then you're a real Christian. <laughs> right, Kim? <laughs> when you can get to the place where God's got to check you out, or as the young people say, you got to check yourself before you wreck yourself. Identity has everything to do with the effectiveness of our ministry. So the focus of these two questions was about identity. And strangely enough, the people that God gave the most beautiful identity were the people that gave him the most trouble. The Jews. Israel... Why? Because they placed greater emphasis on their identity than on their character. They placed greater emphasis on their national identity than on their spiritual responsibility. So you can walk around and say you're having us all you want, but if your life doesn't match what you say, what's the purpose of the judgment? The purpose of the judgment is not to tell God anything, the purpose of the judgment is to say, I know what you profess, but that's not what you live. I know what you say on Sabbath morning and the songs you sing, but that's not how you live outside of that. The judgment begins at the house of God, 1 Peter 4, 17, so that the Lord will say, this is what you profess, but this is what you do. That's why the examination of ourselves and of our identity today is so vitally important. The people that God had given the oracles of truth, he gave them everything they needed. He gave them the right message, the right day of worship, the right health message. He gave them all that they needed to be a light to the rest of the world, but their a national identity superseded their spiritual responsibility. So they could not be effective. That's why the Apostle Paul wrote these words in Romans 9, verse 6. But it is not that the Word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all what? Israel, who are of Israel. You see, national Israel did not fulfill the call for spiritual Israel. Why? And here's the hook. They did not become the kind of Israel that God wanted them to be. What kind of Israel are they? When they started worshiping with the Amorites and the Amalekites, my wife and I are in the middle of the, reading the book of Jeremiah. We're at the point where we're saying, okay, uh, Ezekiel, right? We finished Jeremiah, now we're in Ezekiel. We're kind of saying, Lord, okay, we got it. They were wicked. They were horribly wicked. They were terribly wicked. We just read about Olohai and Ohololiba. 
Samaria and Jerusalem, those are words that we don't say every day. And the Lord talked about them as two sisters. One was wicked, the other one was wicked, and the one that was wicked. And all of this is chronicling, chronicling the life of people that God called to be representatives to the world. And when you read Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Isaiah, right, Ron, you're saying, Lord, have mercy. What was wrong with them? When you look at all that messed up stuff, no wonder they rejected Jesus. Because the very one that was trying to reach them through the prophets, through the, through the prophets of old, was there himself, still trying to reach them, but they wouldn't open the door of their hearts. Because their national identity was more important than their spiritual responsibility. What am I saying? Israel anchored their security in their way of life. They anchored their security in the observance of the Sabbath. They anchored their security in the distinct understanding of the Scriptures, which God had given to them. They anchored their security in eating the right things and not eating the wrong things. Huh. They anchored their security in the distinct understanding of the tabernacle, the sanctuary that God had given just to them. But in life and practice, they were not the kind of Israel that God wanted. So let's make the, let's segue now. God says, okay, enough. He picks disciples. He trains them, send them out as apostles, and says, what they fail to do, you do. The Christian church begins to burgeon. It goes through persecution 10 years. You shall have tribulation 10 days, but be of good cheer. And so the church goes through the 303 to 313 A.D., Roman Emperor Diocletian persecution. And all it does, it gives the church impetus to begin to keep growing. The more the Christians died, the more the church grew. Every one Christian that died for took his or her place. Amen, somebody. You know why? Because they were the kind of Christians that the Lord needed. You couldn't stop them. The fire was heated. It didn't shut them up. The, 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 the stadium is filled with mean, hungry lions and tigers. It wouldn't stop them from testifying. And some of us can't hang, on, some of us can't hang from a bad look. I ain't going back to that church. You saw the way they looked at me? They hung with the Lord in the den of lions. They still testified when they were heating, they call it, when they were heating the woods, they called them the faggots in those days. When they were heating them up to burn up these Christians, they were still testifying. You couldn't shut them up because they were the kind of Christian that Jesus needed. But here we are in the comforts of the last days. Our couches are comfortable. Our homes are comfortable. Our cars are comfortable. The house is warm. We got money in the bank, food in the cupboard, a degree at the end of our name. We are well known. We got an identity. We are Seventh day Adventists. And the more I thought about this, I said, I got to ask my church, what kind of Ventus are you? What kind of Ventus are you? Because Satan laid a snare for the people of God in the Old Testament, did he not? Amen. He brought them out of Egypt. And he laid a snare for the people of God in the wilderness, did he not? And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, in one day, 23,000 died. He said, you're out of Egypt, but you ain't going to make it into Canaan. He laid a snare for them at the border of the promised land, and some of them never made it over. He laid a snare through them in the days of the ministry of Christ. And they nailed, him to the, they nailed Jesus to the cross. The sneer was so successful that the very ones that Christ had given the responsibility of proclaiming him, they took up the responsibility of persecuting him instead. They, he laid a snare. During the rise of the New Testament church, the devil laid a snare again. That is the reason why, so I could help you understand, that is the reason why at the very beginning of the New Testament church, God allowed Ananias and Sapphira to die. 
because he wanted to make it sure, he wanted to make it clear, wait a minute, wait a minute, we're about, we're about to start a brand new movement here. I want to make it really clear, I don't tolerate double-tongued people. If you're, going to, if, you're going to, if you're going to commit it to Christ, commit it, but don't say you're going to commit it and lie to the man of God and say, well, it was a mistake. Solomon the wise man says, suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin and say before the Lord it was a mistake so that God will destroy the works of your hands. If you're going to be committed, be committed. If not, don't be committed. But don't say you're committed and don't commit. That's why these phrases in the Bible, when you look at how the devil is in every setting, in every scenario, in every meeting, in every opportunity where God can be praised, the devil is trying to get us not to be the kind of ventist we need to be. Remember, pastor that I knew very well down in Miami, he was on his way to church. You know, in Miami, a lot of cars, and he's just really upset that this person is so slow in front of him. You ever been behind a slow driver? It's like they're really testing your, your fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You know, you're like, God, it's a Sabbath day, but man, I tell you, is thou shalt not kill off the table? Man, I need to get to church. And like, they could see you in the rearview mirror, kind of looking around the car, and is there any more space? Some of you know what I'm talking about. And so, this pastor found a little bit of space, just enough for his car and he to get by, and he passed by, and he said, and I sure did give him a look when I went by. Well, the car kept following him, followed him right into the church parking lot. <laughs> come to find out that they were visitors coming to come to his church and hear him preach. <laughs> so on Sabbath morning, he's standing in the pulpit. He, first thing he did when he got to the pulpit, he said, I need to humble myself. I need to, and he saw them in the audience. <laughs> he know they saw him because he gave them that look. <laughs> I want to just say I am so sorry, Curtis and Dara, for the look I gave you when I drove by. You could come to my house for lunch, I promise. It's going to be really good. <laughs> uh, and, you know, he said, I suffer from road rage. What kind of ventus are you, Pastor. He asked me that too. So this is not a sermon that's designed just for you. We all have to be the kind of ventus that Jesus wants us to be in the last days. What do you say? Because there are certain phrases in the Bible that, that really pulls my coattail. To, to make it into the kingdom, we've got, we cannot be like the Israel of old. We cannot have just a label. We've got to have a life. Our life has to testify to the fact that we are children, sons and daughters of the Most High God. It has to be reflected not in just how we eat, how we dress, how we live, how we worship, but who we are when all this has been suspended for the next five or six days. Amen. These are the texts that always pulls my mind back. Matthew 7, 23, I don't ever want to hear these words. Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. That happened to Israel of old. Matthew 25 and verse 12, another one. When the virgins realized they did not have enough oil, and they went to get the oil, and they came back and they knocked on the door, the Lord says, I say to you, I do not know you. And here's the reason why. Titus 1 and verse 16. They profess to know God, but in works, what do they do? They deny him. So works is your life. Whether you, whether you think that you could teach the 2300 days very well, we do that in our class right now. We're going over the 2300 days. But I don't want my knowledge to be the reason, and I've been seeing this, that's why God has changed my attitude and my approach towards evangelism. Because we could give the most amazing evangelistic series. We, can, we start with Daniel 2 and talk about all the kingdoms of the world, you know, Daniel 2, all the all the, the, you know, the, the gold and the silver, the bronze, the iron, the iron and clay. And when we're done with that, people say, that's right, that's, that's right, that's, that's biblical, right, Bob? I mean, you can't argue with that. That's history. And we say, is it true? Yeah. Well, now that we went through the 28 fundamentals, is it all right? Yeah, I want to join your church because it's, 
because the teachings are right. But people join our church for right teachings, but we never tell them how to live right. So we got broken folk trying to live in harmony with good teachings that are right and scriptural. Now they are aware of the fact that they're broken up. They don't know what to do right. They bring all the brokenness into the... And as the Bible says, you cannot put new wine in old, old wineskins. You cannot put new stuff in old stuff because the old stuff is going to burst and the wine is going to be poured out. So for us to be ready for the coming of the Lord, we got to look at ourselves and ask ourselves truly, clearly, distinctly, am I the kind of dentist that Jesus wants in his kingdom? Because, because when we get to travel, these are the questions that people are going to ask us in the unfallen world. What kind of Jesus is he? Tell us. And we'll be able to testify Here's the kind of Christ he is. But our lives have to be at the place, right, Cynthia? That our lives have to tell that Christ is resident. So we got to learn how to measure our thoughts, measure our words, measure our actions, because the world, as Paul says, we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, witnesses. What manner of man ought you to be in all holy conversation and living? So let me talk about some kind of Venice, the kind of Venice I ran into. Because I realized that the enemy studies the weaknesses in our characters. And he wants to get those who are given the responsibility of proclaiming this last message to be, to be people that say it, but don't live it. So people will say, I know what they say, but I know who they are. You can keep that sad ventism over there. Because if we don't live what we proclaim, people make their decision based on how we live and not how we proclaim. So let's talk about the first group, mad Adventists. <laughs> I have met my share of mad Adventists. I got a call while we were in California preaching at Pleasant Hill. I met a mad Adventist. I got an email from a mad Adventist. I got a phone call from a 77-year-old mad Adventist lady. And this started this way. Is this Pastor Loma King? Yes, this is. You got to watch out how you, you say, yeah, it is. Why, you called me, didn't you? <laughs> is this Pastor Loma? Yes, it is. You got to be, you got to, the servant of the Lord must not strive. But you know, you feel like saying, so who did you call? Yes, this is. I'm mad with you. Why? Because you are not rebuking the general conference. Rebuking the general conference over what? The vaccine. I said, ma'am, do you not know that to take or not to take the vaccine is a choice? I know that, but you should be telling them that they should be giving us a letter so that we don't have to take it. Why aren't you doing that? I try my best, Curtis, to reason with her. And I was saying, come on now, stay, be, a vet, be, a, be the right Ventus. I couldn't get her to change her mind. She said, you know what? I'm getting mad. I'm going to hang this phone up because I'm, I'm about to lose my religion. I'm getting mad. But I'm going to tell you this. I'll never listen to your sermons again. And here's what I said. I said, man, before you hang up, let me say this. For you to let the vaccine become the reason you would, would not hear a preacher preach the three angels' messages. I feel sadly for you. But if your decision is to not to listen to me again, I hope you keep listening to Jesus. Have a good day. Before I was finished that, I just heard, mm. man. People that are committed to issues more than they are committed to Christ will be mad. People that are convinced that it's our responsibility to fix the church will lose their focus. And when you focus, let me say it clearly, on non-salvific issues, what kind of issues did I just say? Non-salvific issues, issues that cannot contribute to your salvation 
When you do that, you will lose focus and you will be mad. Didn't they get mad at Moses? Have you brought us out here in the wilderness? I mean, there ain't no Kentucky Fried Chicken out here. We need to go back to Egypt. And where's McDonald's? What did you give us to eat yesterday? Manna. Who wants manna? I don't want manna. We need to go back to Egypt where we will buy the pots of leeks and onions. Remember that? I can smell it right now. We need to go back to Egypt. And they ended up not becoming the Israel that God wanted them to be, and they ended up dying in the wilderness with a quail in their teeth coming out of their nose. Is that what you want? No. My brethren, we have to remember this is God's church. Can somebody say amen? We are God's people. The church is built on Christ, and God will finish what he started. Isn't that right? We've got to be careful that when we see stuff that we don't like, that we don't make it our responsibility to start rebuking folk. Now, I know what I'm saying because that's exactly what one of the disciples tried to do when Jesus confronted him with the condition of the church in his day. Look at Matthew 13, verses 20 to 30. What the Bible says. Matthew 13. Okay, ignore that. It's Matthew 13. That's what happens when you're human, like me. Where's Will when I need him? <laughs> Matthew 13, verses 28 to 30. Just think of 13. Yes. He said to them, when Jesus talked about the condition of the people, he said to them, an enemy has done this. So whenever you see something that is not the way you want it to be, an enemy has his hand in it. The servant said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up? He says, do you want us to go root the tares out from among the wheat? And look what Jesus said in verse 29. But he said, no, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. What is Jesus saying? You don't know. I cannot look at this congregation and tell who's tears and who's wheat. Only the Lord can. Amen? Because some of you are not yet where God wants you to be, but because you're not there, I can't tell you that you are not going to be in the kingdom. Your journey began at a different time than mine. I am responsible for where I need to be, and you are responsible from where, to where you need to be. A child at two years old is a perfect two-year-old a child at seven is exactly where the Lord knew he would be at seven. A Christian that's been following the Lord for many years ought to be far advanced than a person that just started following the Lord a year ago. We are all responsible for where we ought to be. But the Lord said, no, don't do that. And then he says in verse 30, let both grow together until when? Until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tears and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat where? Into my barn. We have to keep in mind, this is God's church. Let's make a point that's extremely clear. John and John are going to make this point today. God can fix what he built. If a dentist could fix your cavity and a cardiologist can help you with your heart and all the other professionals can help you with the things that are broken in your life, do you not think that a God who creates universes can't help us fix things that are broken administratively? You think that God is saying, oh, what am I going to do with the general conference? What am I going to do with pastor this and pastor that? No, God puts pastors in the positions that they're in, not so much to help you get saved, but let me make a testimony. God made me a pastor to save me. You guys get the benefit of what God is trying to do in my life. But if he can't do it in my life, then your life won't be any better than my life. That's why in the book, Selected Messages, book 2, page 390, a quote that we must never forget. There is no need to doubt, to be fearful that the work will not succeed. God is at the head of the work. Say that with me. God is at the the head of the work, and he will set everything in order. If matters need adjusting at the head of the work, God will attend to that. And work to right every wrong. Let us have faith that God is going to carry the noble ship which bears the people of God, how? Safely into port. Amen, somebody. Amen. So God is in charge. He's in charge. Who's in charge? 
God is in charge. If your marriage is messed up, God's going to fix it if you let him. If your home is messed up, God will fix it if you let him. He says your vision has to be different. Look to me and be saved, Isaiah 45, 22. All you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. If you're looking in the wrong direction, you'll be mad. But if you look in the right direction, you'll be glad. You will go from a sad, vent a mad Venice to a glad Venice because you know that the Lord can fix what's broken in your life. Amen. Let's go to the second category. Had Ventus. <laughs> right, where did he come up with this one? I get phone calls from people that have had it with the Seventh-day Adventist church. They say, I've had it with Sabbath keeping. So they leave the church, write a book against Sabbath keeping, get all these people that have had it with the Sabbath too, and now they're following them. And they have a whole group of folk that have had it with the Sabbath. And they're trying to convince us that the Sabbath is not legitimate any longer. I can start mentioning names. I get books. I spoke to a guy once on the phone that lived in Arizona. He used to be a school teacher in the Adventist church. He, be, he, he became beside himself. His intellect got to him, and so he thought his intellect was greater than God's Sabbath. So he wrote a whole book. All these reasons why the Sabbath shouldn't be kept. And he said to me, I have had it with you guys saying, remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. So he left. We just read an article just a couple of days ago, somebody posted it on Facebook. One guy said, I'm leaving the church too to make it easier for you guys. Because I don't think the Sabbath needs to be kept either. Why would the Lord say, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy if he didn't intend for us to keep it? Amen, somebody. Amen. But he's leaving. And I said to him, I said to my wife as she's reading this post on Facebook, guy says, I'm done with the Sabbath. I can't justify making it difficult for my job. So I'm leaving the church so I don't have to keep the Sabbath. So I'm, I'm no longer guilty on that. I'm going to make it easy for you guys. I'm leaving. And I'm thinking, make it easy for us. You better keep your carcass where it is because you're not going to be saved. There are those that had it with the standards of dress and adornment. The love of the world is greater than their love of holiness. They're on Facebook too. There's a lady on Facebook. Years ago, I, 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 helped, I asked this lady, help my sister go back to church. The worst, she's a had Venice. The worst testament of an Adventist. She posts up, I, I drink a little bit of alcohol every now and then. I wear my jewelry when I go to work on the weekend and I take it off on Sabbath. They don't need to know what I'm doing. Had Adventist. I've had it with the standards. I've had it with what the church tells me to do. Then, then there are those that have had it with the writings of Ellen White. Her writings are out of date, they say. I've had it with those writings. You guys keep quoting her. I've had it with her. Out of date, irrelevant, not for the 21st century. Well, you tell that to Time Magazine, who listed Ellen White as a woman 100 years ahead of her time. I'll bring that article and show it to you. Who Paul Harvey, in his own testament, said, if this woman could be right on so many things, on information that wasn't even available in her day medically, what else can she be right on? And Time Magazine did an article how she discovered the ill effects of pork and smoking and alcohol long before this information was even available to the medical community. Time magazine, a woman a hundred years ahead of her time. But there are those that said, I've had it with her. They throw her books away and they read James Dobson, all this other nonsense. There's some good stuff in other books, but why do you give up gold for wood? There are those that have had it with the Ten Commandments, had it with the sanctuary message, Believe me, many of you that have been around long enough, you remember the Ford movement. Desmond Ford tried to get rid of the sanctuary message because he had it with it. And a whole lot of pastors went down that path and got deceived by, by this gentleman, Desmond Ford, because they had it with the sanctuary message. And it saddens me to hear some Adventist pastors saying, there's never a possibility that there'll ever be a Sunday law in the future. I'm saying to myself, under what rock do you live? Scriptures are clear. When the Bible predicts it, it's just in God's timing when it will come to pass. Amen, somebody. Amen. What does the Bible say about had Advent? Had Adventists? Here's what the Bible says. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 10 and 11. It says, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved, and for this reason God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. If you don't want truth, 
you'll get what you want. Like the Israelites of old did not want manna, they wanted quail. God gave them quail and they die with it in their lips. If you, if you don't want truth, God will give you what you want. But I know today there is a remedy for those who have had it. Amen? There's a remedy for Adventists, and here it is. 1 Timothy 4, verse 16. If you don't want to become a Adventist, here's the, here's the counsel that the Bible gives you. Take heed to yourselves and to the doctrine. What are the next three words? Continue in them. For in doing this, you will both what? Save yourself and those who hear you. Amen. Amen. Yeah, you could give it up. But I heard that statement. If, if I leave my seat in first class on my way to the kingdom, somebody's going to sit in my first class seat on the way to the kingdom, and I'm going to miss that flight. I'm staying in my seat. What about you? Amen. Stay in your seat. Jesus paid for it with his own blood. Don't get pulled in by the mad Venice and the had Venice. I got another category. Let's talk about the sad Venice. <laughs> there's, some, there's some people that are always sad about something in the church. The church is not going to make it. They point out everything in the church that makes them sad. I'm sad the way that tithe is being used. So I ain't paying tithe. Well, you never paid it in the beginning. If you thought it was a bill, that's why you have that attitude. Tithe belongs to God. Can you say amen? Yes, I'm sad that the direction the church is taking. Look at our schools. It's so sad to see what's happening. Let me tell you something, brother. We are living in the time of the shaking. Do you believe that? Yes. And anything that can be shaken will be shaken. So don't get pulled into that sad ventism movement. Ah. Yeah, and they say, I'll be glad when it's all over. I will be too, so they can have something to be happy about. <laughs> Sad Venice Church. I can't, you know, how you doing? Oh, it's been such a tough week. Say, it was tough, but God brought me through it. Yes. Amen, Mark? It was tough, but God brought me through it. I almost had that accident, but I didn't. I did have the accident, but I'm still here. Amen? Yes. Stop looking for, and they, you know, these are the folk that, Always eating garbage on Facebook. Always eating garbage on Instagram. They look for all these sad pastors, sad ventists, people that left the church and they preach sad sermons on, on YouTube. Put all the sad stuff together and they come to church and you go to your house and you go to their house and smile. They wonder, why are you happy? <laughs> I'm happy because I am the child of Jesus. I'm on my way to the kingdom. Anybody else happy for that? There are a lot of things to be sad about, but don't be sad. It's going to soon be over. And this is not true. This is not new, Ramona. This happened in Jesus' day. Look at Matthew 6, 16. He had to deal with it back then. Matthew 6, 16. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a what? Sad countenance. That fellowship line says, I'm fasting. Why are you fasting? You don't look happy. If you're going to look like that, don't do it. You should say, I'm fasting today because I'm getting stronger. Man, don't make your face, I'm fasting. If it's that bad, don't do it. Amen, somebody? I got to go to church tomorrow. No, you don't. If going to church makes you sad, don't go. Nobody wants you in church like that. <sighs> I got to go to Bible studies tomorrow night. <laughs> you get my point? If Bible studies are that bad, don't do it. Somebody ought to be happy for Bible studies <laughs> or happy to go to church or happy to keep the Sabbath. Stop being sad about stuff. The Lord says, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, what happens to the sad Venice? They have their reward. <laughs> right, Paul? Right? But they have, you want to walk around like, yeah, I'm a Sabbath keeper. And these are the sad ones. I can't eat pork. I can't party on Friday night. I can't gamble. There's a $2.1 billion lottery. I can't buy a lottery ticket. <laughs> it's sad that the church won't let them do what they want to do. I can't drink alcohol. I got to give up smoking. I can't even have a little bit of pork. I'm so sad. 
Who want to be, who want to be converted to that? Amen? But if you say, I'm so happy that Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me, we tell the kids, if you're happy, you know it, what? Amen. Clap your hands or say amen. Or well, as the preacher said, if you're happy, let your face know it. Adventism will never convert anybody to be an Adventist. That's why Paul, he lived in the days when he was dealing with some sad folk in Philippi, and here's the words he wrote to them. Philippians 4.4, 4. come on, let's say it together. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say what? Rejoice. you got to understand the context. Paul was being persecuted in Philippi, but in the midst of his persecution, he kept rejoicing. Even if you lose somebody, I've lost two mothers, I've lost friends, I've lost loved ones. Even if you, the Lord even has a scripture for those that get sad when they lose somebody. Look at this. 1 Thessalonians 4.13, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you, what, sorrow as others who have no hope. Yes. We lose loved ones, and we don't want to lose them, but the good news is if they died, if they are resting in Jesus, I know I'll see them again. Amen. He said, we're going to sorrow, but don't sorrow as folk that don't have hope. The world don't need to see that. What kind of billboard are you going to be? What church you go to? Oh, I'm in heaven. Even when we're going through trials. Look what Jesus says in Matthew 5, 12. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. When people say bad things about you, I'm having to learn how to apply this scripture. Believe me. I'm having to learn how. To, I got mad when they called me a Jesuit. They said, I'm a Jesuit. I'm a, I'm a Mason. I work for Rome. I got mad. I had to shoot a. You probably see my, my, my response on YouTube. Anyway, if you haven't seen it, don't look for it. It gets you upset when you know you're preaching the truth and people say, oh, he's a Jesuit. And the same guy says, do you know that most Adventist pastors are Masons? And I'm thinking, yeah, right. I'm the worst Jesuit you ever met. <laughs> Rejoice and be exceedingly, exceedingly glad for what? Great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. If you are persecuted because you're doing God's will, what's the first word, friend? Rejoice and what be Joe be exceedingly glad. I love me some Joe. I like Joe because Joe hears stuff that's not right and he fixes it. You know, he finds a classic way to say it. People say, Well, you know, they're in heaven right now. And Joe's Joe standing there calculating. Hmm, how could I tell them they're not in heaven? You know, the Bible says they're resting. That's a man committed to scriptural excellence. So when people are not happy, don't join a parade that's not for happy people. Some people like to have sad parties. Don't invite me. Okay, I got two more. We're going to end on a good one. Amen? But not before we go to past this group. <laughs> Bad Venice. These are those that leave the church and spend the rest of their lives throwing stones at the church. I wrote this one down. They use the name Adventist to convince you that they are committed to a worthy cause. Look at what the church is doing. Look at what the church is doing. Look what the church is doing. You don't think God sees that? You think that God is saying, I'm glad you pointed that out. I didn't know that. You think that God don't see what's happening in this church? Amen, church, over here, amen. God sees what's happening, and you know what? Wild people are out there trying to stone God's church. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is my church. Upon the rock I built, upon this rock I built my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Amen? Amen. So all these YouTube preachers use the term Adventist to try to pull Adventists in. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you, don't become a garbage Ventist. Because there's, there's some people that spend all their time on YouTube thinking that if it's in a video, it must be right. No, it's not. People call me, hmm, okay, so is it true or is it not? I got a call out in California. Is it true or is it not? Is what true? Is it true or is it is what true? Are you really a member of the World Economic Forum? No, I just get their emails. But somebody said you are a member and you can't deny it. I said, I just get their emails. 
so that I could inform my church about what's happening in the final movements in the world. I just get their emails. So I wrote the guy back that accused me of being a member of this clandestine group, cleared it up, and I said, you need to fix this, brother, because that's not correct. So this sad Venice, bad Venice, puts another video up. I was going to call Pastor Loma King. I meant, to, I meant to email him back, but I didn't do either one of them, but I'm going to go ahead and double my double down on the fact that he is really a member of the World Economic Forum. And I felt really bad, you know, until I found out, wait a minute, he don't like Ted Wilson either. He don't like Mark Finley. He don't like Doug Batchelor. He said, Mark Finley, Doug Batchelor, Ted Wilson, and John Loman King are all Jesuits. And, when Mar and Stephen Bohr now, he just added Stephen Bohr to the list. Stephen Bohr is all, we're all a part of pulling the world back to Rome. And so Mark Finley was here last Sabbath. He said, John, we are in good company. Amen? Amen. If we are preaching Jesus and preaching the truth so vehemently, you've got to expect that there are those that claim to be what you are, and they'll use that label to pull folk down the wrong path. And some of them have the nerve to even use the word in front of their ministry called amazing. Here's what Ellen White says about this group. And I want you to hear this carefully. In Great Controversy 88, page 519. There has ever been a class professing godliness who instead of following on to know the truth, make it their religion to seek some fault of character or error of faith in those whom they do not agree. Such are Satan's right-hand helpers. Accusers of the brethren are not few, and they are always active when God is at work, and his servants are rendering him true homage. They will put a false coloring upon the words and acts of those who love and obey the truth, they will represent the most earnest, zealous, self-denying servants of Christ as deceived or deceivers. It is their work to misrepresent the motives of every true and noble deed to circulate insinuations and arouse suspicion in the minds of those of the what? Inexperienced. In every conceivable manner, they will seek to cause that which is pure and righteous to be regarded as foul and deceptive. Don't listen to bad Ventus. Come on, say amen. And they are not a few. There are a whole lot of them. But here's the problem, Matthew 7, verse 3 to 5. Here's their problem. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye, Hypocrite, say that word with me, hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. <sighs> Let me remind you, God loves his church. Acts of the Apostles, we read this in the book Acts of the Apostles, page 12, paragraph 1. Enfeebled and defective as it may appear, the church is the one object upon which God bestows in a special sense his supreme regard. It is the theater of his grace in which he delights to reveal his power to transform hearts. Amen. I'm not all the way there yet, but he's working on me still. Come on, say amen, somebody. God's still working on you? Yes, let him do that. But here's, here's what those Babylonists say. The church is going to apostatize. They're going to go away. They're going to fall apart. They're going to join Babylon. That's not what the servant of the Lord says. Select the messages, book 2, page 380, paragraph 2. The church may appear as about to fall, but it does not fall. Hallelujah. It remains while the sinners in Zion will be sifted out, the chaff separated from the precious wheat. So we're not going anywhere. Amen, somebody? Amen. If you got issues, let the Lord fix it. He'll get you through. So i got to end on a better note than all these other four. Can I end on a good note? The last group are those... Let's start with John 6, verse 68. And I love this. When Peter looked at the bad Ventus church in his day, the Lord says, are you going to leave me too? And I like what Simon Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Where are you going? You're going back to 
darkness, you're going back to error, you're going back to untruth, where are you going? Stay here with all the rest of the broken folk and let God fix us all and get us ready for the kingdom. Amen? And when people point out your faults, say, you may be right, but God is not done with me yet. He who has begun a good work will complete it. Are you going to stay around for God to complete the work? Let's look at the last group. We're going to end on a good note. Finally, they're Adventists. I want to be in that group. Anybody else? Amen. Can all the Adventists say amen? amen? These are they that recognize God is not finished with them yet. They remembered who they were. And they know that they are only righteous by the presence and power of Christ. They are pressing toward the mark and their determination by the strength and the power of the Spirit of God working in them. I want to be more like Jesus tomorrow than I am today. I want to be more like Jesus the next day than I was last week. They recognize that they are dedicated to a message and a mission. And they will not compromise the proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's messages. That's an Adventist. That's an Adventist. That's a remnant. So when people say, well, are we the remnant? Yes. But are we all yet fully remnant in character? God is still working on us. But let me encourage you, brethren, because we have not yet seen the vortex increase. We have not yet seen the tornado or the hurricane of all the accusations that will come against Adventists. Adventists should be glad that us. Glad that God is in charge of this thing and nobody else. That's why my favorite scripture, when I look at how this thing is going to wind up, I'm going to invite the praise team to come up. When I look at how this is going to wind up, this scripture has become my favorite Bible verse of all time. It used to be Romans chapter 13, verse 11 to 14, but now this is the one. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called what, church? Children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us, so it'll think of us as mad Venice, sad Venice, bad Venice, had Venice. Oh, no, but we're at Venice. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Look at verse 2. Beloved, when, my brothers, now we are children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know. Say that with me. But we know. Say that with me. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Let me make it very clear. God raised up the seventh day Adventist church to proclaim Christ and him crucified, to, pro to, to proclaim the righteousness of Jesus, to proclaim forgiveness, salvation, transformation. Can somebody say amen? to proclaim that there is still a way that we can make it in by the grace of Christ, to proclaim that no matter how dark your life is, it can be bright when Jesus transforms you, forgives you, brings you back, makes you whole, makes you pure again. That's the reason I'm here. I'm not here because everybody likes me. I'm here because Jesus loves me. And I want that love to be transferred through me to somebody else. I may not like you, but I'm going to love you. And when I get to love you, forget about the like. It's going to be far beyond the like it's going to be the love. I don't love you because you're just like me. I love you because we want to all one day be just like Jesus. I love this quotation in the book Evangelism. Page 119, paragraph 3, my last quote. In a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. On them is shining wonderful light from the Word of God. They have been given a work of the most solemn import, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's messages. There is no other work of so great importance. They are, allow, they are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. Amen? That's what God has called us to do. That's why I wrote that little booklet, the three angels' messages in summary. You want to find out more about that, contact 3ABN. That is why I did that. Because God wants us to know that message, live it, and proclaim it. So don't get sidetracked by the sad Venice and the had Venice and the mad Venice and the, and the bad Venice. Become a seventh-day Adventist. So when somebody says, who do men say that you are, Will? 
Who do men say that you are, Jay? Who do men say that you are? Who do men say that you are? So you can say, I don't care what men say, but I know who he is. I've seen his life. I've seen the way he lives. I've, see, I've seen Ramona. I've seen Alice. I've seen Angela. I've seen the difficulty. I've seen, I've seen them. I've seen them in those moments. I've seen Ajima work through the difficult moments when nobody's watching. I know who they are. I don't need you to tell me who they are. I know who they are. They know Jesus. And I want to know the Jesus that they know. I was speaking to a young man who came to my meetings, named name of Mario Martinez. Raised in the Baptist church, got baptized twice. He came to my meetings and was sitting along the aisle, kind of like where Leon is sitting. And he was leaning in the aisle every night when I preached. And he came to me one night and he looked at me like this. Puerto Rican guy had to look like, yo, what's up? And I said, he said, let me tell you about myself. I've been listening to you every night, but I don't think, I was 17 when I got baptized. I was excited about going door to door, knocking on doors, but the pastors and the churches I went to, they don't have any time for me. I don't even think God has a plan for my life at all. I don't even think God cares about me. And I said, no, 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 he does care about you. That's why you and I are talking right now. He said, what do you mean? I said, let's talk. And I sat down with him and we spoke for about a half an hour. I said, it's all about God's timing, not your timing. God, if he didn't have a plan for you, you wouldn't be here. Here's my phone number. Gave my personal cell. He said, I've been baptized twice. I'm not getting baptized anymore. That night I preached a sermon washing away the past. Jorge remembers. That young man got up and came down as one of the people that responded to that call. I was choked up. And afterwards he came to me his face was different. His eyes were bright. His eyes were lit up. His face looked like God had turned a light on. I could understand what it was like when Moses came down. His, his, the, the transformation between a few days before and that night, and he went like this to me. I said, what's wrong, Mario? He said, you know what you did? You gave me back my hope. I, I'm, I'm starting to believe that God does have a plan for my life. And he said, not that there's anything wrong with all the other denominations, particularly the people, but he said, I, I just want to say this. I know why they call you guys a cult. I said, why? He said, because they don't want people to hear the beautiful message of Jesus Christ that I just heard tonight. You gave me back my hope. And I was in tears as I hugged that young man. He says, I thought I'd never say this, but I'm more of an Adventist than I've ever been of a Baptist. And I'm getting ready for baptism. Amen, church. When the Lord, that said to me, okay, devil, I don't care what you say about me on the internet. This is why I preach. When those young people came forward, those teenagers came forward, those husbands and wives came forward, those people came down to give their lives to Christ. Call me what you will. I'm going to keep preaching Christ and him crucified. So who wants to be a Seventh-day Adventist to get ready for the coming of Jesus? Would you stand with me? This song tells our testament how often do we need Jesus every hour every hour we are Christians in Christ we are seventh day Adventist Christians because Jesus is the anchor of our faith he is the one we exalt the diet the day of worship all these things mean something because they mean something to Christ they don't come before him he comes first those who follow him walk as he walked. Let's sing the song today. before the last stanza, I want to just make an appeal. Is there somebody here today that say, you know what? I don't want to be a bad, bad Venice or a had Venice or an ad Venice or a sad Venice. I want to follow Jesus all the way today. I want to make a difference in my life. Anybody today? I have my hand up. You can join me. 
If that's what you want, if you want God to bring you through all this stuff, we're going to go through a vortex. It hasn't come yet. The, the winds are blowing softly now. We haven't seen anything yet. If we can't hang on now, if we can't hang on now, what are we going to do when the world turns against us intentionally? God is trying to toughen us up now, be soldiers of the cross, people dedicated, committed. When nobody's watching, committed to be what God calls you to be. So when you stand before the unfallen worlds, they'll say, I know what kind of Ventus you were. That's why you're here. You are Jesus Ventus. You love the Lord. I want to hold on. And Pastor Turner stood that day and said to me, finish the work. Finish the work so we can go home. Pastor Turner, by God's grace, God will help us finish that work. And maybe Jesus will come in our lifetime. You want that? Yeah. Let's sing that last stanza together. I need thee every hour. I need Heavenly Father, we know we need you. We live in a world today that what they need more than anything else is a candle lit in the life of your sons and your daughters. May we be candles when we walk into the stores that we attend. May we be candles when we're traveling on the plane. May we be candles. May people see a light in our lives that you have lit. You said a candle that has been lit cannot be put under a bushel. We don't want to be Seventh-day Adventists in name only or in doctrine only, but in life, in the transformation that is taking place. Lord, help us to be patient with one another. When we don't see in each other the things that we know should be there, Let's just know that God is still at work in the lives, in the minds of our brothers and sisters. Let's not become so frustrated and so mad that we dissect each other because we don't see them representing Christ the way they should. May we pray for one another. May we uplift one another. May we know that in our weakness, your strength is always made perfect. If we're not there yet, Lord, help us to Breathe a brother or sister's name in prayer. Say, Father, work on them as you work on me, that I could love them where they are until we both are where you always knew we need to be. Send us forth as laborers into this vineyard, and may our testimony in our lives be so clear and that Jesus' presence be so obvious that people will first see you in us and then they'll want to know, how did you become that way? Who are you? What do you believe? And when they ask that question, they will come to know what you can do for them and your beautiful, saving message. So keep us, work on us, get us ready until the day that you said, we will be like you when we see you as you are. In Jesus' name we pray.